Hi, and welcome to this week's confirmation class for seventh grade. This is gonna be posted for the November 18th class, again, for seventh grade. At the end of this uh, class, there will be two questions that you'll need to answer. I invite you to send those answers to me through email, whether here on, uh, on Facebook, um, on the Facebook post, or you can text them to me at seven um, at my phone number. Let us begin with a word of prayer. Good and loving God, we give thanks. As we gather together in this class and ask that you would bless us and bless the faith of these young people. Be with them in these extraordinary times and remind them of the love that you have for them in your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. Well, today we're gonna to talk about the birth of Jesus and, <clears throat> excuse me, Jesus calling his first disciples. So let's begin. First, some introduction on the birth of Jesus. Oh, sorry, I hit the wrong thing. Here we go. The birth of Jesus is found in the Gospels of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke. So two spots where we can find these, this story. The one you know best, sorry, having technical difficulties. The one you know best is from Luke. That's the one we read every year on Christmas Eve. But we're gonna look at both stories. We're gonna look at Mary and Joseph and their backstory, and then we're gonna go into the birth of Jesus himself. So I want you to turn in the New Testament to the Gospel of Luke, chapter one, beginning at verse 26. Now in your Bible, <coughs> for most of you, that page is going to be page 1696, 1696. All right, so turn to 1696 for most of you in your Bible. Luke chapter 1, verse 26. All right, here we go. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. Now, here I've read these two verses. What do we learn right away from these two verses? They set up a lot of what we need to know in this story. First, an angel comes. Gabriel was sent by God to bring a message. All right, bring a message. That means whatever this message is, this is going to be really important. And sent to a town, a specific town in Galilee called Nazareth. Okay, this is important because the Messiah the foretold anointed one of God is said to come from Galilee. Now, not, now this angel sent to this town is sent to a specific person. And that person is named, that name is Mary. What do we end up knowing right away about Mary? We learn that Mary is engaged to a man named Joseph and we learn that she's a virgin. Now, if you don't know what that means, that means someone that has never had sex before. Now, we also learn something about Joseph, too. Joseph is of the house of David. Well, the prophecy of the Messiah is that the Messiah will come from an ancestor of David. So here in two verses, we learn a ton of stuff that we need to know about this story right away. Let's continue. And Gabriel came to her and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom there will have no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, here am I, the servant of the Lord. 
Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. So what's the message that Mary receives? She receives, hey, even though you're a virgin, you're going to bear a son and not just any son. The son of God. He's going to restore the house of David and rule on his throne forever. He's going to be called favored one, son of the most high. It's a big message. Think about that. You're a virgin. You're not yet pregnant. And an angel comes and says, hey, you're going to be pregnant with the Son of God. And what's Mary's response? Well, first, she's a little afraid when the angel appears. You would too if an angel just showed up. But notice those last lines. Here am I, the servant of the word, servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Mary accepts this message and believes it to be true, she calls herself a servant. She is ready to be what the Lord needs her to be. Now, what proof does Gabriel give that this message is true? Because it seems kind of fanciful. Well, her cousin Elizabeth is pregnant and she was supposed to be barren. We've met this character before. Last class, John the Baptist. That's right, John the Baptist and Jesus are cousins. So Gabriel says, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Elizabeth is the sign of that. And Mary will be as well. And again, what does Mary call herself? Mary calls herself a servant. She is a servant. All right, we're going to continue on. Let's go to Luke. We're going to continue in Luke and do the birth of Jesus in Luke. Then we're going to go back and look at Matthew. So you want to go to Luke Chapter 2, that's page 1699 in your Bible. Now this is the reading that we read on Christmas every year. So let's start with the first seven verses. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. And this was the first registration that was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth of Galilee to Judea to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. So what's the importance of these first two verses? In those, decrees, in those days, the decree went out from Emperor Augustus. What these two verses do is, do is place this story in actual history. You can look during when did Emperor Augustus reign? When was Quirinius was governor of Syria? When did they do a registration? We call that nowadays a census. We just did one uh, for 2020. So... It shows that this is part of history, that this story can be dated and is part of history. The date, by the way, is approximately 3 AD. All right, now let's continue. Why are they going to Bethlehem? We've, now we meet Joseph. We've just kind of heard, uh, heard of him. Joseph, who lives in, uh, in Nazareth, and he is going to Bethlehem. That's the city of David. He is going to his ancestral home for the census to be registered. So he's going, and as all other people who are from the house of David are going to Bethlehem, David's city, to be registered. And why is that important? Is because it's going to set the place on where this is. And it also lifts up the fact that this Jesus is descended from David, just as the prophecy of the Messiah foretold. All right, it's not only that his father, his earthly father, mind you, is a descendant of David, but he is born in this city of David, reinforcing this imagery of being connected to David. Joseph is from Nazareth, that's important. That's just kind of a small town in Galilee. No big deal, a no big deal town. And where is Jesus born? He is not only born in Bethlehem, but he's born in a barn. Born in a barn. 
And why? Because there's no room for them in the inn. And the reason there is is because all these people have been traveling to come to this place to register. And they, have, they need, need a place to stay. And so it was full up. And so Jesus is born in a barn, laid in a manger, a feeding trough for animals. All right, let's turn the page and look at Luke 8. Luke chapter 2, verse 8 through 14. In that region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. So he was born this day in the city of David, a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the child the multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, as it had been told them. All right, so who's present in this scene? Well, we have angels and we have shepherds. Now, why is this significant? Well, angels, again, as we know from earlier, angels are messengers of God. So here they're bringing a message. But shepherds are interesting. See, shepherds, not high on the totem pole of society. They lived outside. They dealt with animals all day. They're lowly. All right? They're, they're just not really high on the scale of importance in the world. And so because of this, here we have angels bringing this amazing message of the Messiah being born to lowly people to the downtrodden, to the poor. It shows what kind of Messiah Jesus is going to be. This Messiah is not going to be for the rich and for the powerful. This Messiah is going to lift up the lowly, the poor, the hurting. Now what's this message? Hey, good news. To you is born this day in the city of David, a Messiah, a Savior, a Lord. It's a great message. This is why we call it good news. What's the sign of that message? Well, the sign of the message is that they will find a child wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger, right? Just like the angel Gabriel gave Mary a sign that, what he, that his message was true, so these angels give a, a sign to show their message will be true. So I already read all the way through 15 to 20, so sorry about that, and I should have stopped a little earlier. So how do the shepherds respond to this? They go, they go check it out. They go, they find the child and they see the child and know that the message is true. How does Mary respond to these dirty shepherds that she doesn't know all of a sudden coming in talking about angels? Well, she does what she did when the angel first gave her the message that she had found favor with God. She ponders, she treasures it, she thinks about it. Okay, pondering. Okay, she, she takes a moment to soak it all in. And then what do the shepherds do after they see Jesus? They rejoice. They return right back to being shepherds. They glorify and praise God for all they'd heard and seen. They give thanks for what had been told them. All right, that's the Luke version. Now we got to go to Matthew. So we're going to turn to the first chapter of Matthew, verse 18. And that page number for you is page 1607. 1607, Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, we're doing 18 through 24. Now, while we do this, I want you to pay attention to how different this side of the story, this version of the birth of Jesus is, okay? I want you to pay close attention. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. 
when his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son. And you ought to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord to the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she, became, until she bore a son, and he named him Jesus. Now, what's Joseph supposed to name his son? Jesus. Now, have you already started to see a lot of the differences? All right, and we're going to talk about them in a second, but keep those in mind. What's this birth of fulfillment of? Of this prophecy. The prophet, by the way, this is, is they quote the prophet Isaiah, who we heard about a few weeks ago. All right, the fulfillment of would have been spoken through the, this prophecy that the Messiah would come. Now, who's the main character in this story? The main character is Joseph, right? It's all about Joseph. We learn all about Joseph. Mary is kind of in the background. While in Luke, Mary's at the forefront and Joseph's in the background. Notice that in Luke, the angel visits Mary. In Matthew, the angel visits Joseph. In Luke, Mary is, to name, is told to name the child Jesus. In uh, Matthew, Joseph is told, told to name the child Jesus. Now notice in Luke, there's all the stuff about going to Bethlehem and to register. That does not happen here. We do not know the place. We do not know where. We don't know um, if the child is put in a manger. That, uh, that does not matter. Now also notice that um, in both cases, Mary is a virgin, right? If you hear... Um, when you hear, uh, and Matthew says, but before they live together, that means they're not married. That means they have not had sex. All right. And notice too that Joseph is a righteous man. Joseph is a kind man. So Mary becomes pregnant and Joseph doesn't know why. What's the only explanation in most logical senses? Well, Mary cheated on Joseph. So Joseph has the right to not marry her and dismiss her. But he doesn't want to do it in a way that he could have because he doesn't want to cause her any embarrassment. But when the angel comes and tells him why she's pregnant, then he does as the Lord commands. All right, now, you might want to be wondering so far, we've had these stories, but there's been no talk of wise men. Where are these wise men? Here they show up here in Matthew chapter two. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, Wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is this child who has been born king of the Jews? For he observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out. And there ahead of them went the star they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. And on entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. All right, so some things from this story. First, why do the wise men come and see Jesus? Well, they come and see Jesus because they see a star and it's rising. They, under, they have divined that a king has been born. And so they've come to pay homage to this king. Now, because of this reading, we know that they go to Bethlehem, right? Which was not clear in the, in the story of the birth of Jesus. 
that Jesus is in Bethlehem and was born in Bethlehem. Notice too what happens after Jesus is born. Now, all right, so, so I have my little thingy in the way here. So what's the significance of them coming to see Jesus? Well, the significance is that means that Jesus, his birth is not known just to people in Israel, but this is Messiah to be a Messiah of the whole world. These wise men that are coming, they're not Jewish. All right, they're not from the tribes of Jacob. All right, they are outsiders. And yet they hear this, they follow the star, they hear this message that a king is to be born. Now, um, we celebrate this on a festival day after East, I mean, after Christmas called Epiphany, which happens on January 6th. Well, that's where the 12 days of Christmas come. From Christmas Day to January 6th is 12 days. That's the 12 days of Christmas. Now, also, we say there are three wise men that come. We don't know the exact number. The only reason we say there are three is because they present three gifts. Gifts intended for a king. All right? And so we say there could be a bunch of them. There could have been 500 wise men. Who knows? All right? But we say three because of the three gifts. And there we have the story of the birth of Jesus from Luke and Matthew. Take a quick second as we get ready for our next uh, class, our next uh, topic, which is uh, Jesus uh, and Jesus' disciples. I mean, Jesus calling the first disciples. All right. So, we find the, the calling of Jesus' disciples in many of the Gospels, but we're going to use um, just one. We're going to stay in Luke because we're because um, we've been in Luke, so we're going to go to Luke chapter five. All right, Luke chapter five. You're going to find that on page seventeen oh six. Luke chapter five. Verse 1, 1706. Now we're actually gonna, we actually are jumping ahead here. We're actually gonna go back um, in our next class and talk about Jesus' baptism and temptation, which occurs before this. But I want to do those things together because they're linked together. So we're just gonna jump ahead a little bit. Um, uh, so we're kind of like going from chapter one of the story to chapter four, and then we'll go back to chapters two and three. All right. So Luke chapter five. Verses 1 through 11. I'm going to read it and I'm going to answer a few questions. Once while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let your, down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long, but have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. So, what's Peter's reaction after fishing again? Right? Peter and his, and his uh, partners, James and John, they're brothers. James and John are brothers. They're out fishing, they've caught nothing. That's like when I fish, which I don't, I haven't fished since I was like 12, because God bless you though, that love fishing, but it's not for me. But they fished all day, they got nothing. All right, Jesus says, hey, let's go out in the boat. Let's go fishing again. And also they catch all these fish. Simon Peter realizes, uh-oh, I think I'm in the presence of the divine. I'm in the presence of someone holy. And so he says to Jesus, Get away from me. I'm a sinful man. Get away from me. I'm a sinful man. 
right? It's the same reaction Isaiah has, right? When we learned about the call of Isaiah, when he's in the presence of the Lord, go away from me, I'm a sinful man. Peter recognizes his sin in the presence of Jesus. Why do you think Peter says this? Go away from me, I'm a sinful man. Because he feels guilty of his sin. He feels he's unworthy to be in Jesus' presence. Right? He feels like he is definitely not good enough. Frankly, that's the way we often feel. We often feel that we are not good enough for God's love. That we see our sin and think there's no way that God could love us. Jesus shows us that God loves us even though we're sinners. That God has sent Jesus to love us who are sinners. Now what do you think Jesus means when they say they'll be catching people? See, Jesus is giving them a new mission. A new vocation. The vocation before was to catch fish and provide for their families. The vocation now would be to spread the word of God. That they will be collecting, for, for lack of a better word, other disciples, other people to follow Jesus, that they will be bringing people God's word through Christ. They'll be catching people. And notice that they leave everything to follow him. They leave everything. The boat's on the shore. What happens to the fish? I've always wondered, did that fish just go away? Do they give it to other fishermen, other people there? They leave everything to follow him. Why do you think? They would do that. Would you be willing to do that? Would you leave your cell phone behind, your computer behind, your friends behind to follow Jesus? See, they know that this Jesus is not just a simple prophet. They can tell right away that this Jesus is something more. And they want to see what this Jesus is going to bring. They follow Jesus because they have faith and trust that Jesus is going to guide them and lead them. Notice here that Jesus has given them no reason to follow him other than making where there was no fish happen, where there's no fish, to be a bunch of fish. To them, that's a miracle. And because of this miracle, they follow him. The miracle that we have that helps us follow Jesus is that Jesus dies for our sins. That Jesus loves us despite our sinfulness. That's the miracle. The miracle is that we know the grace of God and that's why we follow Jesus. Because we are saved. We can't save ourselves. Jesus saves us and that's the miracle that helps us to follow him. So how are you called to be a disciple? Notice that Jesus comes to these, to these fishermen and doing what they're normally doing in their everyday life. You are called to be a disciple in your everyday life. You are called to share the good news, to catch people by telling others how much God and Christ loves you, the way in which Jesus has given you strength. You're called to be a disciple by hearing his word, by doing stuff like confirmation. You are called to be a disciple through all the ways in which God is interacting in your life. And here's the thing, you are called to be a disciple and Jesus will love you and be with you on those days that you follow him immediately and on those days that you doubt and wonder. So you are always a disciple. You are a disciple for the moment you are baptized and the Lord will continue to be with you. Continue to be willing to catch people for Jesus. And that's our class. So here are your two questions that you need to answer. Again, you can answer them through the Facebook post. You can send them an email. You can text them to me. Here are your two questions. From the first um, part of this class, your first question is, what was the name of the angel that came to Mary to tell her that she was going to birth the Son of God? Again, that question is, what was the name of the angel who told Mary that she was going to birth be birth the son of God. And your second question. Your second question, what are the names of Simon Peter's partners in fishing? What are the names of Simon Peter's partners in fishing? Those are your two questions. 
All right, let's conclude with prayer. Good and loving God, we give thanks for the birth of your son, Jesus, a birth that brings us salvation and eternal life. And Lord, you have called us to be disciples. Help us to be like the shepherds who proclaim Jesus' birth. Help us to be like these first called disciples that follow Jesus. Help us to follow Jesus every day, knowing that he loves us and has saved us. Watch over us and keep us, keep us safe and remind us every day of how much you love us through your son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Again, you have two weeks to answer your questions. We'll see you here online two weeks from now. God bless and have a happy Thanksgiving.